7 Takeaways from UFC 213 Inches Once again, the International Fight Week pay-per-view had a tumultuous build. Losing Cody Garbrandt vs DJ Dillashaw was a blow. Robbie Lawler dropping the week before it was bad news too. But the worst was yet to come just hours before the show started, as Amanda Nunes was hospitalized. That being said, the show must go on. This time last year, UFC 200 ended up being a dud as Fight Night just cooled and escape the disarray of the build. But more recently, UFC 206 had one of the worst builds in UFC history, leaving the threadbare card devastated and destined to fail. When it came time to throw down though, it was arguably the most entertaining pay-per-view of 2016. In reality this was something in between. The pay-per-view started well, fell off a cliff in the middle, before a really good main event sent the crowd home happy. A new interim middleweight champion was crowned, and perhaps a new number one contender for the heavyweight championship emerged also. But as good as the main event was, the fight of the weekend was on Friday at the CHA finale. Bombs were thrown and chins were rattled on Friday in a fight of the year candidate. Here is everything you need to know about 2017's International Fight Week. 7. There was one more twist to come. Just a few hours before the start of the show, the news came out that Amanda Nunes was taken to hospital and the main event was in serious jeopardy. In truth, when a fighter is taken to hospital on the day of a fight, you know anything other than a cancellation is irresponsible. In the end, Dana White claimed that Nunes was cleared to fight, but opted not to. While it would be unwise to lie, it makes little sense to bury your champion. Many people criticized the lack of promotion of Nunes ahead of the Ronda Rousey fight, and in all honest I White should have kept that snippet to himself. An interesting storyline quickly developed as strawway champion Joanna Jedrzejczyk offered to step in on an hour's notice to face Shevchenko. Those girls faced each other three times in their Muay Thai career, with Valentina winning all three times, and while it's a fight you can count on down the line in the flyweight division when it opens, now wasn't the time. Especially for the 135 pound championship. While weight cutting is a huge issue in MMA, Shevchenko walks around at 135, which leaves her undersized. And she's bigger than Joanna. So the idea that Jedrzejczyk could regularly win at Bantam weight is frivolous. As for Nunes, it's a black eye when the UFC were ready to finally get behind her. Dana White hinted they might rebook the fight for September's UFC 215 card in Edmonton. Well wait and see. 6. Robert Whittaker is going to be tough to stop at 185 pounds. Despite everything, the most anticipated fight of the weekend ended up in the main event slot at the last minute. Yoel Romero, always a crazy man, almost knocked out one of his corner men thumping his chest on the way to the octagon. And then the fight began. And what a fight it was. At the end of the first round, a Romero side kick landed to Whitaker's left knee. He told his corner that the knee was trashed. Romero's biggest mistake was that he didn't capitalize on his opponent's bad wheel. Romero was clearly two rounds up, but Whitaker gutted it out, taking the last three as Romero tired. 
Whitaker utilized the front kick well to simultaneously keep Romero at distance, and work the body to deplete the Cuban's gas tank. Perhaps the biggest story was that Whitaker was able to almost completely nullify Romero's wrestling. As an Olympic medalist in freestyle wrestling, Romero is no slouch in the grappling department, but Whitaker was able to stuff with wizards, great sprawls and athleticism. An impressive all-round performance from Bobby Knuckles. Michael Bisping came into the cage and caused some histrionics to build up the upcoming title unification fight. But it cooled and take away from Oceania's first UFC champion as he racked up an eighth straight win to take the interim middleweight championship. While only the interim champion for now, it's hard to imagine him without gold anytime soon. 5. Alistair Overeem vs Fabricio were to mix posed the current rules of MMA. Let me preface this by saying I scored the fight 29-28 for Alistair Overeem. That's an important distinction as we open this debate. Overeem edged a nondescript first round, and clearly won the second, without doing a huge amount of damage. Fabricio Wordham was able to turn it around in the third round, rocking Overeem with a big knee, taking him down and dominating the entire round. Who did the most damage in the fight? Wordham. Who had the longest periods of effective control in the fight? Wordham as well. So how did Alistair Overeem win the fight? The unified rules of MMA are no longer unified. Coming in on 1 January this year, some commissions haven't adopted them. The Nevada State Athletic Commission haven't over six months later, and thus we were under old rules at the weekend. The 10-point must system is another bugbear for many. Under the new rules, judges are instructed to be more liberal with 10-8 rounds. Wordham's third would have clearly been a 10-8 under new rules, but as such, only one judge scored it that way, scoring the fight a 28-28 draw. The crowd booed the decision, but in all honesty, the judges did what they had to do under the current system of deciding fights. Overeem was two rounds up going into the third, so Wordham needed a finish to win or a destructive round to avoid defeat. The way we score fights is fundamentally flawed. This fight was the latest to expose it. 4. Anthony Pettis looked close to his best. Jim Miller is no tune-up fight in the lightweight division. Anthony Pettis had dropped four of his last five in the worst run of his MMA career and was handed a tough task on his return to 155. After moving down to featherweight and then missing weight in an interim title fight, Pettis needed to turn it around quickly. It would be hyperbolic to say this was Anthony Pettis at his best. That being said, there were some fleeting flashes of brilliance that hinted at a return to prominence. During Pettis' losing streak the biggest criticism was that he could be outgrappled too easily, and he did show one sloppy moment in the fight, getting a little over-enthusiastic on a back take and somehow failing to get either hook in. That being said, Miller is a high-level BJJ player, and Pettis won a second round that took place almost exclusively on the mat. In the first and third. Pettis showed off the dynamic striking that made him world champion. His jab was on point, and the variety of his kicking attack was a definite positive. Landing with body kicks and high kicks, including one that opened up a huge gash on Miller's head. Pettis did try a cartwheel kick towards the end of the bout, but that was jumping the shark. 
It remains to be seen if Pettis can get back into the title picture at 155 in an ultra-competitive division, but that was a solid first step. 3. Rob Font needs a bigger challenge. Rob Font opened the main card with a masterclass against Douglas Silva de Andrade. The Brazilian striking looked reasonably smooth, but Font was too fast. He found a home for his lead left hand consistently, throwing jabs, hooks and uppercuts, which set up the big right on the back end. Font is an extremely well-rounded fighter at 135 pounds but has largely been forgotten recently. Has been the victim of some late pullouts of late, which has stunted his progress a little. For one in the UFC with his lone loss to the impressive John Lineker, Font has finished all of his octagon victories. As the fight wore on, you could see the confidence draining from Silva de Andrade, who just cooled and find an answer. Font won every minute of every round, and dominated striking, the clinch in the ground game. Font's submission finish was a thing of beauty. He grabbed the neck on the way down looking for a guillotine. He was able to get his left leg over the right shoulder of Silva de Andrade, and use his right leg to hold his opponent in position to get the correct angle and torque for the tap. Bantamweight is a top-heavy division at the moment with the formidable trio of Cody Garbrandt, TJ Dillashaw and Dominic Cruz at the top. Those three would be a bridge too far right now, but Font deserves a step up in competition next to see where he really stands. 2. Travis Brown needs to call it today. Father Time has never taken a loss, and the drop-off for Travis Brown has been remarkable. With six performance bonuses to his name in UFC, he was always among the best heavyweights in the promotion. But now, it's a different story altogether. Brown is a miserable 2-6 since the start of 2014, and has been finished four times in that run. Saturday's loss to Elksio Leonik capped off a miserable 12 months, with four straight losses. Ain Velasquez demolished him at UFC 200. Fabricio Wardham defeated him in a lopsided decision where Wardham didn't look particularly sharp himself. Then Derek Lewis knocked him out in an admittedly entertaining bout. The Olena Klaus was something completely different. The Ukrainian is a submission master, but doesn't have a lot to offer on the feet. When Brown wobbled him early, it looked like he was set for a bounce back. But Olenuk was able to recover, and then get a knockdown of his own. From there, there was only one winner. And showed nothing after the knockdown. His ground game has definitely improved in recent years, but Olenek wrapped him up like a Christmas present in the second round, eventually submitting him with a rear naked choke. 34 isn't particularly old, especially for a heavyweight. But Brown looks a shadow of his former self. And it's only going to get worse from here. 1. That you finale's main event was glorious. There wasn't much else of note to talk about on Saturday, but the main event of Friday night was out of this world. Justin Gethge admitted his fighting style will get him knocked out soon enough. And while that didn't happen on Friday, you knew exactly what he meant afterwards. Making his UFC debut, Gutch, pronounced gay chief or anyone unsure, would go to war with Michael Johnson in a sensational main event. The internet exploded, and many suggested they should just re-air this fight on the pay-per-view afternoons versus.
Not many people would have complained. Animosity on the way into the cage, there was no glove touch, but respect was earned during 9 minutes and 48 seconds of insanity. Johnson would drop Githj twice in the bout, but wasn't able to put him away. came back, rocking Johnson with a huge uppercut, and then a knee in the clinch all but finished it, as the highlight pounded out the menace for the TKO win. Clearly battered and bruised Guthj, tried and failed twice to scale the cage, before then climbing on top and doing a pretty impressive backflip off it. A crazy finish to a crazy fight. It's rare that someone can become a star with one fight. But that's what happened on Friday. If you haven't seen it yet, go watch it right now. You can thank me in the comments.